Now please welcome Professor Marcy Morgan, Director of the Hip Hop Archive and Professor of African and African American Studies. There's no money associated with it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's a great honor. It's an endowed chair. What is the name of that chair? Ooh. Ooh. No, I want to know what is the name of the chair. I keep forgetting. No. Okay. okay. What is yeah. the name of it? It is new. So, E. Moran or something? It is the Ernest, Ernest Monrad. Monrad. Give it up. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I want to make <laughs> I want to make sure he doesn't like because he's so it's going to take me like no more than five minutes. Okay, I promise. Okay, all right, all right. Because he's ready. He's, you know, um, who? What is it? I I don't have to. Uh, I stay stay ready. That way I don't have to get ready. So he's ready. Um, <clears throat> in the late 1970s. So let me. Back up a second, and welcome to the Hip Hop Archive. If you haven't been here, please take a look around, and uh, we have a sign-in sheet outside if you want to be on our mailing list. And okay? don't touch anything. <laughs> and don't spill anything, okay? <laughs> In the late 1970s, the youth who gave birth to the Hip Hop Nation did not come out of nowhere. They came from the core of African American communities and social and political practice where critical narratives, irony and wit are the fabric of the culture and a symbol of pride, critique, and resistance. Whether from the Bronx, the Caribbean, Atlanta, Chicago, so I'm naming places that I know people are we're like, why didn't you name this? So if I didn't name your place, uh, I apologize, okay? Chicago, said that twice, England, South Africa, New York, or New Jersey, this youth who fashioned the art, culture, and politics were reared on an endless tale of the American dream versus the American nightmare. They learned early that the black Muslim leader Malcolm X was told by his high school counselor that he should not aim too high for his own good that the police seem to serve and protect others, and that justice is directed at just us. When urban youth tossed cardboard boxes on the streets of the Bronx, relaced and unlaced their sneakers, refashioned their dress, reconstructed sound systems, made graffiti public art, and redefined synthesizers and mixers, they did so with the determination and creativity shared by abandoned and exploited youth who preceded them in the 60s and 70s as well as those throughout the world. Through their resolve, they created something bigger than hip hop. Giuseppe Pipitone, also known as UNET, is hip hop. He believes fervently in the evocative power of oral history where narratives, narratives, images, words, rhythms, and moods are constantly chasing each other, giving the beat to the flow of his tales, which finds in memory the first reason for being. Since the mid-80s, his research has focused on the rhymes of the MCs from the golden era, such as Chuck D, KRS One, Brother J, uh, which opened up for him the path to black radicalism, which he recognizes as the counterpart of the Italian ra radical movement. He is a believer of empowering and educational of, of empowering and the educational power of hip hop. Since the mid 90s, he has been on a mission, traveling the length and breadth of the United States to interview and collect memories and reflections of artists, intellectuals, academics, prisoners, and activists. In 2003, he began the collaboration with Black Soil International Hip Hop Film Festival Rotterdam, becoming an official me member of the advisory board. 2006 saw the publication of his first book, Bigger Than Hip Hop, Stories of the New African American Resistance. In 2007, in, in collaboration with graphic artist Paper Resistance, they created the illustrated biography of George Jackson for the Ingenious X edition in Blood in My Eyes. In 2008, he published Renegades of Funk, 
and or a musical commentary on the origins of hip hop in the Bronx of the 70s. Since 2005, Giuseppe has participated in numerous international conferences focusing on hip hop and politics, and has spoken at universities and institutions such as Stanford, uh, Black Soil, B-Boys for Life in Birmingham, uh, UK, Clarion University, et cetera, et cetera, and of course, most importantly, Harvard. Um, he writes regularly for Alias, the cultural supplement of Il Manifesto. In 2012, he published his third book, Louder Than a Bomb, The Golden Age of Hip Hop. He's currently engaged in oral and pictorial history project on the Latin Quarter, um, a legendary uh, hip hop area in New York City in cooperation with the Paradise Ar Ar Architect. Though hip hop's influence in the world is often overstated, in some respects it has done more to crystallize a young urban African American and global youth identity than any recent historic and political change. Moreover, it has managed to do this while highlighting unique and culturally valued aspects of different society. As a lingua franca, its fam familiar slogan, get in where you fit in, claims inclusion as the foundation of hip hop ideology, but not without parameters. That is, hip hop's development included African American cultural values of justice, freedom, and equal representation. Through both commercial and underground media, the art, dance, music, and words of hip hop have transcended language, neighborhoods, cities, um, and national boundaries, resulting in international varieties where marginalized groups and political parties appropriate hip hop as a symbol of resistance and where ethnic, religious, and re regional disputes are renegotiated. Simultaneously, hip hop fights for local identity and against marginalization of any group that comes together around hip hop's edicts. In 1992, when the group Public Enemy toured Europe with the rock group U2, their charge to hip hop uh, nation of Millions was Fight the Power. The slogan began to appear on walls in England, Poland, Italy, and more. In fact, not only did a worldwide audience quickly gravitate to hip hop's unrelenting critique of society as well as notion of community recognition and representation, but also hip hop fit within already established international, local, and national movements for justice, education, rights, and independence. The talk today explores ways in which blacks in the UK negotiated sources of diasporic culture to create what has come to be known as black British culture. It is get in where you fit in, respect, represent, and come correct. It was building the hip hop nation. It is a representation of hip hop ruled the world. Imagine that. It is an honor uh, and uh, I'm incredibly excited to introduce to you this afternoon, Giuseppe Unet Pipitone. How's life in London? Yes, and after this introduction, it's even more difficult for me to start. <laughs> but I, I would like just to say that this morning, Facebook reminded me that 10 years ago today, March 13th, 2009, I was with a number of other people, with Murray Foreman, uh, David D, Chuck D, and, and other people at the Barker Center in the Thompson Room for a panel on global, uh, global hip hop. Yes, I think so. I don't know if it was the same day of the panel, but it, it, was, it was on those days. So, thank you very much for being here. And as Dr. Morgan just told you, uh, the title of my speech today is How's Life in London? I would like to start uh, this, this talk with a quote from 80s rapper Money Love, who alongside uh, Zlik Rick is one of the most known artists from the London hip hop scene of that time. The quote reads, my greatest contribution to hip hop was allowing the United States of America to know and understand exactly how far they reach, how influential they are to children in completely different countries, because I am the import. I am one of the first success successful imports on the hip hop tree of life. And I am too an import on the, on the hip hop tree of life. And I would like, with what I'm going to tell you in, a, in, a, in the next slide, I would like uh, to let you understand how, how far 
hip hop reach and how influential rap music has been for me and for a number of, uh, of people and kids, teens of the 80s like, like me. Uh, in 1985, I was sent for the first time to London to learn English. While I was there, I had the chance to see some of the early hip-hop practitioners in Covent Garden, a popular shopping and tourist site in the heart of London once associated with the fruit and vegetable market. During this time, I began also to see glimpses of this new subculture being practiced in my city, Milan, in Italy. This spread my interest in hip-hop culture. But an pivotal moment happened in 88, when I was given a Public Enemy's album, It Takes a Nation of Million Told Us Back, as a present. I put the needle to the record and was completely unprepared for the sonic noise I was about to hear. I was struck by the depth of Chuck D's voice and lyrics. On the album, there's a song, and I'm this party for your right to fight, in which Chuck raps about a number of black leaders who had been framed by the FBI, the act, by the FBI director J. Edgar Hoover. Listening to Chuck D's rhymes, sorry, opened for me a world I had no context for. From that moment on, I was led on to a quest to understand what and who Chuck D was talking about. Back then, there was, the, there was not the easy access of search engines that we have now. Therefore, my only sources of information were books and libraries. Still on that quest, 10 years later, I gave a talk on Counterpro, FBI's counterintelligence programs, and the annihilation of the Black Panther Party at the University of Milan. From there, I began traveling to the US, conducting interviews for an oral history on the Black Panthers. I met grassroots organizers and leaders, as well as political prisoners and people in exile. To this day, this project has not yet been published, and the interviews are still on mini cassette tape, analogic cassette tapes. <laughs> I'm here today presenting a new research project, the first focus on Europe, specifically on London early hip hop scene. From the day I listened to Public Enemy record, there was no turning back. And as you may have understood, I'm not an academic. So I started this research back in 2009, and from 2009 to 2011, I conducted a series of all only audio interviews. Then from 2012 to 2016, I was with a, with a filmmaking crew that helped me uh, to, to give also a video representation to these to this, um, interviews. So uh, now this project and has about 30 interviews with the pioneers of the pop scene, and there are like 60 hours of my conversation with uh, these people. And since I came here, I started what I would like to be uh, the introduction, an academic, historic introduction uh, to this oral history, so that everybody who can read this book can understand what these men and women, at the time, girls and boys, teenagers, uh, uh, are talking about. Okay, this is just to get some empathy for me. <laughs> <laughs> this is me in 88. I managed, wow. I managed sneaking into the press uh, conference room of a fancy hotel before Ram DNC and Public Enemy concert. And I had the chance to, to take some pictures with the Chuck D. And You're so innocent. <laughs> Why? And here? Right there. Ah, here, no? <laughs> and in 2016. No. Let <laughs> <laughs> that be a lesson. <laughs> and the, um, so on the right, it was 1988. And uh, on, the, on the left is um, me and Chuck D in 2016. He was in Bologna before a concert. I was sent by one of the main uh, newspapers in Italy for uh, an interview with Chuck D. That's why I, I, I entitled this slide from 88 till, till infinity. So. Um, How Life in London is a research project which aims to explore the early stages of, of UK rap scene in the 80s and it aims to highlight how musical and lyrical innovation express and sustain black British culture. 
In order to do that, I decided to divide my speech in three sections, each of, of one with, mine quest, with one main question as a driver. So, the early stages. How have US cultural influences been disseminated through forms of UK popular culture, specifically hip hop culture? Some system culture, the second section. What is some system culture? And what is the relationship to the UK hip hop culture? The third section, UK style. In which ways have blacks in the UK been negotiating sources of diasporic culture to create black British culture? Let's get this started. The first rap record ever published was Sugar Hill's Gang, Rapper's Delight, a song which features three performers rhyming over the popular disco hit Good Times by Chic. Not only did it propel hip hop into the, into the US national arena, but it's said to have put rap music on the global radar, as it was an international hit record. For example, it reached number three on the UK single charts in December 1979. The Sugar Hill Gang then increased their popularity in the UK when they were featured on the popular music TV program Top of the Pops on December 6, 1979 of the same year. Until now, every pop book, begin, beginning with David Toop's Rap Attack, published in 1984, has located this record as the moment in which rap music went global. This assertion, until now, has not been challenged. But however Rapper's Delight was a global hit, it, it's important to underline at the time, in Europe, people were not thinking about hip hop or, or rap as a practice, as a cultural movement, or as a style. This, Rapper's Delight, was just one hit record that went global. Sorry. And as you early UK graffiti artist Bundy, Bundy Brad underlies in our interview, 79 appears and rapid lies come. And for, for us, the hip hop, the hippie, the hippie to the hippie pop and you don't stop, it's almost like a, a novelty record. We are all singing the song and learning the rhymes, but we are not taking note of the hip, the hop. We are not. There's nothing there that connects us to that. This last sentence, there's nothing there that connects us to death. There were any indication that could help one understand the complexity of this cultural phenomenon. It, I repeat myself, it was just a novelty record that went global. Two less known factors contributed to the understanding of hip hop culture in the UK. The first was Africa Bambata World Tour in 1982. And the second was the Malcolm McLaren's Buffalo Gals video. For the UK youth, the first occasion where every aspect of hip hop culture was brought together in one place in 1982 was uh, with Africa Bambata New York City Rap Tour. This tour brought the top New York City DJs, rappers, graffiti artists, double Dutch team and break dancers to audiences across Europe and Asia who had never seen or heard, or heard styles like that before. And although ticket sales were low, drawing small crowds, it was a groundbreaking event for the few, just the few, in the UK who experienced it. And this is how old school graffiti artist Alec Mack, Alex Mack remembers the tour. So in November 82, we rolled, we rolled up in Victoria in a place called The Venue. It was a very strange event. There were some guys doing something with the record at the back, and this bizarre group of girls came on with keeping ropes. There were guys coming on stage doing kind of gymnastic time work to music. There was guys singing and rapping over the mics, and guys doing some canvases, painting on them. It was called the New York City Rap Tour. It kind of blew my mind away because it was all new. So for me, this, this uh, quote is very important, and I got it as important when I was doing this interview, because, because I, it shows you, and it showed me at the, at the time of the interview, that there was, in 82, there was not even the vocabulary to, the, to describe this cultural phenomenon. He's talking about b-boying, or as it known, break dancing, as guys coming on stage doing some kind of gymnastic type work to music. So, 
you can understand that there was really uh, no, no, no vocabulary, no understanding of this cultural phenomenon. As Top of the Pops was pivotal in introducing UK, to UK audiences the US rap hit Rapper's Delight, in 1982, in the aftermath of Bambata tour, uh, a whole generation became officially aware of hip hop culture through the release of one music video, Buffalo Girls, by UK producer Michael McLaren and Trevor Horn, in collaboration with the, most, the world's famous Supreme Team, a duo of hip hop radio disc jockeys from New York City, among the first to introduce the, the art of scratching to the world. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show a little snippet of the video, not the whole video, but a little snip, snippet in order for you to see how the four elements, uh, hip hop culture includes different form of artistic expression. They are called elements and they are, as Africa Bambata defined it in the late 70s and early 80s, they are five, f four main and plus another one. Uh, DJing, rap, rapping, uh, graffiti writing and uh, the dance element, b-boying, breaking, plus a fifth element, which is knowledge, culture, and understanding. Um, in this video, in the first 25 seconds, you will understand how uh, the teens watching Top of the Pops was one of the most known um, TV program, music TV program, and families back then were uni reuniting after dinner in front of the TV, and they were all watching uh, this, this, this uh, TV program. So you will see how these four elements, once televised, had a, uh, had a deep impact on the youth. So, as graffiti artist Bunny Brad, uh, Bunny Brad remembers in an interview, if it weren't for that video, I don't know when we would fully grasp this thing called hip hop. It's a culture. You can break, you can pop, you can DJ, you can do your DJing, graffiti, I'm seeing. Though Malcolm McLaren was defining a culture vulture by Africa Bambata, and he was a controversial character <laughs> even when he was managing uh, the group uh, Sex Pistols. This video had a, a really deep imp impact on the UK youth of those, of those years. In fact, after the video, breakdancing and graffiti progressively increased in popularity as a means to rebel and subvert to the expected roles of urban space for the, the disaffected youth of the Callaghan and Thatcher government. As in the United States, though to a lesser extent, the inner cities of Britain were struck by a series of spending cuts that increased in severity, in severity as the 7th progressed into the 80s. Margaret Thatcher, neoliberal administration, pushed to privatize the gas, steel, and the telecommunication industry, resulting in a spiraling unemployment, unemployment rate and cuts in funding for the arts, recreation, and youth centers. These are the conditions uh, that spawned the emergence of hip hop culture in the UK. The pioneers of the London scene were the youth being affected by those spending cuts. According to MC Mello, an early rapper, quote, poverty was on the rise. People didn't have money, job opportunities, but worst of all, there was a kind of feeling among us youngsters that nobody cared about us, end quote. Also, also in, uh, in, in 1982, Street Sounds, a London-based record label, began releasing rare and inexpensive US singles on a series of affordable compilation albums. The Street Sounds collection were responsible for bringing rap music to a wider audience. 
they became commercially successful su uh, through supplying rap records, distributing music, and allowing new fans to buy the copies of their, fa their favorite violins from their local record stores. At the same time, the increased access to technology, such as on video recorders, was an equally important factor, particularly in disseminating wider aspects of hip-hop culture to an, e an eager audience. Seminal movies like Wild Styles and Style Wars introduced the main elements of hip-hop to British audiences. Both films explore rap music, b-boy and graffiti through the action and voices of the pioneers of the, of the New York scene. The notion of style in this film, rather than focusing upon fashion or pose, reflected the need young, for young people to find their own place in the culture and to, and to de develop their, their unique and original modes of expression in order to make their mark on the environment, despite systematized marginalization. Both films located the inner city as a multicultural, multiracial setting and emphasize, and emphasize the youthfulness of the scene. On the underground level, the London scene also developed through the exchange of music cassettes. Those who had family ties in New York or made trips to the US were the gatekeepers, responsible for slowly bringing mixtape, encouraging small groups to try and imitate what was going on. This is how MC Duke, one of the early rappers in London, reminisces about those days. Quote, at the beginning, it was like a niche music. It was very confined to a smaller group of us because, because we were the ones who had the tapes. If you, didn't, if you didn't have the tapes, you wouldn't hear the music. And that was how the hip hop community, community sort of grew in London. A pivotal, a pivotal moment took place in 83 when Bentram Johnson, better known as Neutraman, a London based DJ, team up with MC Sir Drew and Monoman to record what is widely considered to be the first British rap song, London Bridge is Falling Down. Released on Jive Records, the 12-inch vinyl highlights the code American accent which would continue to be present in most British rap records during the first half of the 80s. London Bridge, though, is the first rap song to make references to the UK through its mention of the boys in blue, the police, and its message about the state of electoral politics in Britain. The Newtonman crew would go, would go on to create Rockbox, the first hip hop sound system in London, and was influential in establishing parties around the city that helped bring hip hop to a wider audience. The, the, the scene at that point consisted predominantly of small localized crew, with many people unaware of what was going on in other parts of the town. So these gems were really important. In 1984, Covent Garden became the first citywide focal point for hip hop in the capital. And this is how MC Mello remembers the Covent Garden scene. This is a, an, an extract from my uh, documentary called As Unstoppable. You know, Covent Garden, for those of us who've been following the hip hop scene and been, had our lives changed by hip hop music from the 80s, Covent Garden represents the heart, the core. It's the centre where we would come from all over London to congregate here, to have b-boy hip-hop, to have the, the graffiti, to have the conversations, the debates. All of that stuff would take place here and we would be all mirrors for each other, reflecting that b-boys, reflecting that hip-hop, continuing that energy and that life. And if you're coming from some other neighbourhoods, when you come here, to Covent Garden, you found people who had the same love for the same thing you did. So the love of the hip hop was a thing that gelled everybody. It was a unific energy for all of us here, no matter the age, the gender, the class, okay, the creed, the color of skin, the ethnicity. It, it didn't matter. What mattered here, this was the place, this was the proving ground. This is where you come and you show and prove what you can do and you will be respected and honored based on your ability and your integrity. So, although romantic, <laughs> given the Russian unrest and, and persistent criminalization of black youth in the 80s, MC Mello refers to Covent Garden as a safe space 
conquered by British youth to engage in hip hop practices. He's remembering his teen years and the early stages of his career. But to better understand I wanna, I wanna, uh, how it was back then, I, wa I want also to, to um, propose to you another perspective from one of the pioneer uh, DJs of the, of the scene, uh, Greg uh, uh, Wilson. You know, Covent Garden. No, sorry. For those it's, OK. A lot of this was about black people being able to come in the city center. You know, it was, a, uh, it was still a very racist time. If you're excluded from what's going on, you make your own parties. Bits by bits, the black audience came into the city center, and that's where it, where it started to really make an impact on the white community. By the mid-80s, London hip hop was epitomized by breakdancing and body popping in Covent Garden, MC Battle at Spats, and Spats was the first hub for UK hip hop. It was an afternoon club open on Saturdays from noon to 3 p.m. and it was open to teens as young as 11. And it was just around the corner. It was in Tottenham Court Road, just around the corner from Gov Garden and Leicester Square, which was, there was a place called the center. It was a community uh, center, which was, uh, the, the basement was given to b-boys and, and graffiti and graffiti artists. So by freestyle gems at the Africa Center, which was uh, close to Covent Garden, and warehouse parties or train gems across the city. Rap music, however, was still understood through live performances. This changed after 1984 as more records began to seep into the market. But while conducting my interviews with the pioneer of the London scene, I understood that most of them had Caribbean backgrounds and that their first musical experience were associated with reggae music. This conversation made me understand that my research and the task would be way more complex than what I thought. I needed to explore the Caribbean influences and understand how UK youth was able to negotiate among these different cultural sources. Hip hop, in fact, was just one on a, of a number of British forms that had thought to, ad, to ad, adopt a music culture deriving from a specific location within the wider Atlantic diaspora and adapt it to the localized condition in dynamic and innovative ways, while still retaining a dialogue with the sources and groups uh, from which the, musically, the music originally arose. Although the Caribbean and US influences have been strongly felt within the black communities in Britain, these influences, as we will see, have been translated, reworked, and transmitted back, often in radically different forms, to, to America and parts of the Caribbean. By the mid-80s, artists had begun to look closer home for influences. Their musical and lyrical concern began to expand, reflecting their experience in London, Britain. Cult cultural theorist Stuart Hall noticed it as it was happening and extensively described this shift from a migrant culture relying upon a borrowed culture to a generation looking to make their impact culturally, moving from, quote, the Afro-American, uh, sorry, the Afro-Caribbean presence in Britain to the emergence of a black British culture, end quotes. Describing this shift, Dr. Harry Louis Gates writes in his Reporter at Large, first published on the, on the pages of New Yorkers in 97 and then included in the book Black and British Culture and Society, a text reader. They turn marginality into a very, um, a very creative art form, life form, really. And they've done so at a level of youth culture, music, and dress. And this is the part I really love. <laughs> 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 they, yes, but I love, for real, this sentence. They styled their way into the British culture. They brought the style changing what was British culture and creating black British culture. But in order to, to, to understand and to tell you how this happened, I needed to understand and to focus more, to explore the, US, the Caribbean influences and, the mus and, and, and its music and the main element asso associated to it, sound system culture. And then to understand what was its relationship 
to the UK hip hop culture. So a sound system is defined as an amplified, I would say a super amplified <laughs> mobile system, invariably called by a name, meant by a team of individuals to create a unique party vibe wherever they set up or play recorded music. With, with its, its tradition of combining records with the skill of toasters who would chat or sing over instrumental versions of songs or exclusive dub plates and combining rhythms, some system culture is, important, is an important part of the Jamaican and British culture and history. Some system, some system culture arrived in the UK with the first wave of immigrants coming from the West Indies. These migrants brought their own music and it was not long before they set up shabins or blues parties. Shabins were often held in private residences of basement as regular Saturday night parties for, for the Caribbean workers who were excluded from the traditional places of English entertainment. In what year is this? Uh, when they started, the, the first wave was uh, 48, with, uh, and then in the 50s, they started um, setting up shabbies, and late 50s and early 60s, uh, some system, some system culture. The races, immigrants, and co encounter came as a surprise to West Indians who had been socialized in the Caribbean to feel that Britain was their mother country. Since their arrival, though, Caribbean immigrants were steered in low-paying jobs in sectors with poor working conditions and were subjected to other discriminatory practices in areas such as housing and education. Much to their surprise, a color, bar, a, a, a color bar was erected between blacks and the rest of the society. And this is how um, hip hop dancer John Z.D. described the role and importance of some system in London. The roots of the West Indian experience in England is the sound system. It is the West Indian blues, the illegal parties, the house parties. Is this context in which the West Indian community can basically be itself. From private blues parties in the 50s to powerful 60s sounds like Count Shelley, through heavyweight 70s root systems such as Jashaka and Fatman, and 80s Titan like Saxon, the sound system provided a social focus for the West Indian commu community throughout London. And this is how MC Mello, another MC from the, the, the 80s scene, explain the importance of some system culture to, for the diffusion of hip hop culture. When hip hop culture came along, we already had a schooling. For many of us, the reggae, the reggae sound system is what honed our skill. We had a foundation that merged, matched, and went hand in hand with hip hop. They were coming from the same place, same grassroots, same type of people, same experiences, beats, rhythms, and the same energy, the same blood. Some system, along with a network of small clubs, record shops, distributors, and pirate radio show, were integral in, developing, in the development of hip hop and other black, black British form of music operating to form the foundation for promoting and disseminating the music, but also articulating a sense of what it meant to be black and British. For many, a large part of, of the appeal of hip hop lay in the fact that it represented a new form of youth culture that while being different from older, more established forms such as soul or reggae, it could be incorporated and mixed with them. As hip hop became increasingly popular across the world, an apparent dilemma formed for those performing outside the US. For many artists, a conflict which raised questions around sticking to one's roots and to the authenticity of the music and putting their own identity and culture, and culture into these art forms. As a result, many of those who first adopted hip hop cultural practices would perform in a way that imitated US artists, mimicking the accent and sticking to the American structure of the structure, sorry, of the music. As UK music writer Andy Wood underlines, quote, for those in Anglophone countries, however, asserting their own identity onto the music is not simple. Within London, the choice to speak your lingo 
to speak your lingo meant that this music was more locally grounded and, grounded and maintaining a distinct self separate from those rappers coming from the US. Thus, hip hop became another resource for identity formation for, for the black British youth. Here you have a little extract from my documentary Unstoppable, and it's six minutes, but it will show you how, directly from the words of the, of the pioneers of this scene, how um, they, they found the, their, their own peculiar style. London is a machine that will continually keep throwing out new flavours of music, one, I'd say once every three or four years. So how we influenced hip hop was by changing the speed of it, by um, adding our own influences to, of samples and breaks. Below zero is how chill I am. What are we doing? There were things like the you know, the samplers that were coming out where you could take a snippet of a song, loop it round, and you'd just be like, damn, this is alright. It was just like this music is giving us and this this genre is giving us freedom to just do what we want. You know, let's have a bit of scar underneath a hip hop beat and put some raps on it. Oh, let's put a bit of dub underneath it, let's put a bit of rock. Everybody, after a while, started creating their own identity and their own sound. Our style, um, our delivery, our techniques, um, it was very important to us because we always wanted to have a distinctive sound. To us, that was important to have that individuality. So, and that's what made us unique. Soon after um, getting the record deal uh, with Musical Life, we quickly realised that we had to make music. So I took my Jamaican background and the, the pop influences and funk influences and score music to movies and I combined that. So first thing I did was, okay, where did I find the energy? Take the break beats, speed them up to 120 BPM. The combination of the energy of the music, the scratching that was on the records, and the ferocity of, of the lyrical ex execution culminated in a style that was so different that it cut its own lane. And that lane eventually be titled Brickcore. For us, it was it was our brand of, of hip hop is the contribution that, uh, that a new genre was defined in Europe and, and carried music forward and was a stepping stone for additional styles that have expanded and and you know, branched out uh, over the years. I don't rap an American accent or nothing. Like that's the that's what's keeping English people back. Rapping in their American accents instead of being English accents. I like most of the UK other MCs. We began our careers with fake American accents because we were just imitating what we heard. We hadn't yet come to a point where we had we had formed our own style. We are UK second generation West Indian, our parents are all Jamaican, but we were born in England, so we represent this. So it was, it was about taking all these different vibes and flavours and amalgamating them and joining them together and finding a way to, to, to bring that back out to the world. But we didn't want to be reggae artists. We wanted to make hip hop music. And if she's got it, I'ma get it, cause I wanna get into it. I used to wanna get into it. They said I couldn't, now I can. Yes, I know I can, can, honey. The way I'm running things is real funny. And hip hop for us, as well as being a way for us to express our creativity in terms of art and music and dancing, was also a way for us to express our social ideas about how we felt about what life was like for us at the time. The place governed by a certain set of rules There's so much wealth and a power Glamour schools a white minority We prefer to have a stronghold Where the black majority are compelled by law To enjoy the land of rightfully own How to stand when subjected to an unclean regime Which means your skin At the time when we were rapping 
Nelson Mandela was in prison. There was a lot of anti-apartheid messages going out and we were very aware politically of what was going on around us. Nelson Mandela, a fellow black brother, I run in a jail in a South Africa. Fighting for freedom, but still not free, just as it's being separated from his family. We wanted to play our part and so we tried to make sure that anybody who asked us to do anything that was to do with making a political song or doing something or a gig that involved anything political, we made sure that we were on it, that we did it. We had to, you know, that was really important to us. So that's how, yeah, we got involved. The Brother Movement asked us to be on the track, be on the 16th parallel. Just that sex won't help our black people. The people she want to help most, I don't think so. We fight for the freedom in the land of our birth cause our people will suffer, suffer, prepare for the world. We want sanctions now. At that point, it was very male dominated, especially with the dancing and the DJing. So all the people that we knew at that point, females were very prominent if they were any good. So the Cookie Crew, so Susie and Mer Remedy, uh, Moni, um, her, her DJ was uh, Pogo, She Rocker. They all came to everything that we was doing. As in, when they played, we went to their things as well. It was a very small community, but big enough to sustain the situation in itself. We weren't into like revealing flesh or any form of sexuality. To us, it was all about just lyrics. It was all about the music and who we were. And also, we wanted to be um, role models for young girls coming up, and that's very important to us. But we were very, very supported by the male um, scene as well. So, and respect. Sorry. As, you, as you have seen, there were many voices, but for the rest of this speech before closing, I will focus on London Posse and some of their lyrics to um, be more clear about, uh, as clear as possible, about this new style and how it came about. So London Posse was one of the earliest group to emerge from the British hip hop scene. When they, were f the, when they first formed, the group didn't have a name. But while playing in New York City as a support from Mick Jones, The Clash, uh, new groups, Big Audio Dynamite, they were constantly referred to as the London Posse by New Yorkers. And, and the name stuck. Uh, they released the first single, London Posse, in 87, and the second one, Money Mad, which is said to be the first record which mix together rap and reggae in 88, before moving to Island Records, uh, Records subsidiary Mango to release more singles as well as their only album, Gangster Chronicle, in 1990. London Posse was one of the first British hip hop acts to merge reggae, sound system culture and hip hop, while rapping about their own experiences as black British youth growing up in South London in the 80s. While American culture has a long history of operating as a vital source for articulating and shaping identities and cultures, it was only one of a few resources drawn upon black, by black British youth and artists looking to develop their own style and voice. The, the UK sociologist Les Beck has emphasized that though black Londoners, like London Posse, recognized similarity between themselves and black Americans based on the condition of economic disenfranchisement and racial marginalization, rap in London, quote, looks out and plots cultural connection with African Americans, while at the same time looking in and reconstituting the local aesthetic of South London. The language and style of South London are thus laced with symbol and cultural fragments from urban American and the Caribbean that are rearranged in a unique way." End quote. Therefore, London Posse was able to reach their audience because of their use of language, which slips easily between Patois, Cockney, and Standard English, often within individual verses, creating a range of voices reflecting the hybrid sounds found in London and other major cities that have experienced uh, large-scale black, black migration and settlement. Parts of London posse influences Lie in the way the, lies in the way they represent not only their location in London and Britain, but in the way they represent the voices of those around them, giving their songs a sense of immediacy and, and auto, authenticity. In the song originally, Original London Style, London Posse Rodney P. raps, I come from London, so when I put up the twang, some just cannot understand the slang and the lingua. The line, 
So when I put up the twang, suggest London Posse play upon their outsider status. While the music is hip hop, the language, the language engender confusion and in, in individuality. And their use of language is in part a calling card that sets them aside from other hip hop acts who at the time uh, had not still found ways to negotiate their own identity. At the beginning of the video, there's a female voice that introduced the songs which ask, they are always churning out with these new words, Cockney, isn't it? What's the new one? This question describes the way in which languages change and evolve. London Posse, as they, sh they shift between different vo voices and dialects, claim Cockney as a part of their own heritage, thus forging possibility for developing a new identity through hip hop. And then Rodney P. raps. This is how we talk down south, creating friction using the gangsta diction. For the mainstream media, both co the Cockney slang and Patois have been linked to criminality and poverty. In other songs, such as Live Like the Other Half Do or Money Mad, London Posse directly critiques dominant media representation of the black British youth, along with racist political attitudes and behavior. Their lyricism provide, provided context for young people to dissect the social and political forces that affected their lives. UK rappers tended to focus on a set of unique tropes sp trope specific to working class youth with, with lyrics addressing condition in London's inner city. By writing and performing rhymes, young blacks in Britain disseminated ideas that reflected the, the diasporic nature of the music elements and history, while simultaneously representing the particularities of racial and class formation in, mul in multicultural London. In another song, How's Life in London, which gives the title uh, to, my, to my speech, and I want to just uh, screen a little, uh, a little snippet. I'm going to screen a little snippet. BBC World Service presents This is London. Me and the Jess land. Yeah. When you pick it up in New York. Yo, bloody, cause it's like them and us, they're rough, they die in England. Yeah, joke, after you play back then, then. Really? Just tell them a little something. What you know. tell them? I tell them about the Slimmies. What Slimmies? The ones in Electrics and I see them. Yeah. yeah. Cause when I see them, I get a rap. What? You mean you didn't store You know that? I did that, but we're about to die through our problem. I believe you. Now watch the heat, we bring fever. Remember rap attack? I used to mack and stalk fever with the backing. And more pop than the magic dragon. Why the split float live? Because we put the whole bag in. I remember there was a slag game. My old days are blagging The nuts man to get But we don't find a check So we skip Find some honey dips And we rock But the night spots Cause that shit Dropping 86 85, 84 or whenever I remember Mandy She used to like never The freak to beat Freak long before I see when I used to ride A scooter with a Honda back Now when we go to Tokyo To go So in this, in this song, London Posse reveals their status as Londoners. But their London is understood as a city that is unknown to outsiders. As you've seen, the video opens up with a close-up of the Big Bang and the familiar sounds of the chimes before cutting to a white presenter who announces <laughs> with an, an authoritative voice, BBC News, BBC News presents This is London. As the, fo as the footage, reveals a group of black youth staring unflinchingly at the camera. In a matter of a few seconds, the familiar images of London, uh, uh, the familiar images of, and sounds of the city have been def defamiliarized. This is London, a, a multicultural, multiracial city. In the video, in this video, visual representation plays a major role, becoming a further tool for identity formation. As Mary Foreman writes in The Hood Come First, such an, approach, such an approach to visual representation is an attempt to link a particular urban aesthetic with a particular place. The, the use of housing estates, street scene, and, land, and landmarks in video stress the importance of place and neighbor to the artist. And in these songs, 
London playfully become the center of the world. Um, both Bionic and Rodney P. rap, check my grammar. The girls in Japan love the slang and the one in Manhattan love the chatting. The song How Lives in London argues that hip -hop, is a, is, the hip hop culture is an international phenomenon, one that translates across borders and cultures. And as Dr. Marcilenia Morgan articulates in her book, The Real Hip Hop, irrespective of where in the world one finds hip hop, it incorporates local and national languages and varieties, as well as nationally and culturally marked symbols that represent space, place, and context. And I'm about to close. The UK pop scene of the 80s put black Brit the black British experience at the, center of the at, uh, at the center of the Atlantic diaspora, developing a dialogue between the black communities of Britain, United States, and the Caribbean, creating an important discourse that privileged no single voice or position, but was multi multi-directional, innovative, and forward-moving. This period of incredible creativity and innovation is the focus of my research. And as nobody till now has written anything about it, that's my, my goal, to create a, this book, an oral history, telling this incredible story. And with this, I thank you. Thank you. Make sure this sucker's on. Yeah, that was great. It was wonderful. Um, <clears throat> one little transition point in the 1970s was on, I was a student and I was working for Time Magazine and I got them to uh, let me write an, an essay called Black London, which that's why I did the piece again for Tina Brown in The New Yorker in 1997. Okay, sorry. And it's called Going Blues. And that was uh, an underground uh, form before, well, 1974, so it was before a lot of things. And they would be all black parties, subterranean, in an illegal space, uh, or in someone's house, but usually in an illegal space, wired for the occasion, be Saturday night, be late, and it was very dark. You know, not like a happy event. And I wrote about that. It was like one of the few black rituals that I ever found threatening. Um, so you could go back and look for that. It's just called Going Blues. Absolutely. And I think I was identifying myself as Skip Gates at that time, if you're ever searching for it. Do, have you ever heard of this, Going Blues? Uh, the piece, no, I thought... No, no, I mean, it's, it was a ritual. It's ah, like yes, a, yes, yes, yeah, about we're that, going yes, about that, but I'm going, I didn't know uh, about that original piece that, that you wrote. And I thank you very much, because even in the report, uh, in. Um, the reporter at large that I that I read, you were talking about uh, uh, illegal parties, and, yes. and 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 it was very very fascinating to me, and I thank you very much because, as you all understood, I came here one month and a half ago. So though I've been working on the oral history uh, since 2009, it I just started doing this academic research, and so any 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 suggestion uh, books name and people to interview. For example, I'd love to interview, and it's one of my goal, Paul Giroy. Uh, any, any that, anything that can add to my, to my research is more than welcome. Believe me, this essay was not a bestseller. <laughs> Don't worry about missing it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but Thank it you. was in Time Magazine, and, and you could find it. I'm just saying, was it, um, I didn't think of it, as, well, obviously, you don't know what a transition point is until it, retrospectively, right? But looking back, there was a form already of these underground parties. And the ska um, was very popular, reggae, of course, blue beat. You know, other forms were being played then. You, 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 you named ska, and it's very interesting because one of the things that one of the pioneers uh, told me that uh, I, I read his quote here, the one who said that when hip hop arrived through reggae, they had already a foundation. Something that I didn't know that there were even with ska music, there was like in hip hop, there was circle where uh, um, dancers were battling each other, 
uh, on the on the ska rhythms, and the the dance was skanking, and this is was something that was totally unknown to me, and that I discovered little by little, just just working uh, with interviews. But now I'm I'm I'm, I'm gonna go. And, and Marley has a song, you know, skanking. Yes, yes, I know the song, but I didn't actually uh, related or uh, linked directly to to that. I I these are things that I learned from 90, 2009 on. You know you should interview? Um, Toots' wife lives on Martha's Vineyard. Toots and the Maytals. Yes, I know. His oh. wife. Um, remember the West Indian yeah. food truck? Yeah. Oh, I think that's was that Toots' wife? Or was it a, who was the other guy? Um, if it wasn't Toots and the Maytals' wife, it's, a, it's somebody else. It's not Marley's wife, so it would be like if there was the big three. Who is it, Marley? We'll think of it. Okay. But his widow, he's dead, and his widow lives on Martha's Vineyard, and she had a food truck. Um, she, but she would be a good person for you to interview while you're here, because it's just 70 miles away. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, Thank you very much. Damn. Yeah, we'll think of it. <laughs> yeah, anyway. No, no worries. Oh, hey, questions, comments. Giuseppe, thank you for that very um, engaging multimodal presentation. I wondered if you could um, uh, trouble the narrative um, based on the slide of Covent Gardens uh, for us a bit. Um, uh, I wonder if you could trouble what might perhaps be an all too clean narrative regarding the flourishing of hip hop um, uh, in the context of Covent Gardens or rather hip hop and other aesthetic ambitions of black people in the context of um, Covent Gardens. And I'm asking because my understanding of the political economy of Covent Gardens um, is quite complex. Um, so on the lines of protest, place, people, and policies. So um, we understand if we could zoom into place that Covent Gardens is um, where the central business district is, that we have a, a host of key banks and um, private law firms that are around there. We understand it's the heart of high theater in Britain and has been throughout the 20th century. We understand um, it to be um, a scene where a number of elite universities are located. We also understand it to be um, a space of significant tourism um, with Absolutely. folks getting off the train to sort of explore. How then in that context, right? Also understanding the, the riots of St. Paul's of 1980s, the Brixton riots um, and the Broadwater farm rights of 1984 and 85. Um, also understanding the intensification of migration <coughs> coming into the UK. Um, thinking about Thatcher's um, uh, racialized neoliberal economic policies. Um, so what I'm trying to get at is that Covent Gardens would have been a highly policed zone. Absolutely. In that context, then, can you help me to understand um, not just that hip hop happened, but the, the quality of the resistance advanced by um, young people in this context in the 80s um, to ensure that hip hop has endured um, and has sustained black British culture to date? Thank you for the question. And uh, um, I had a quote that I might even read uh, later that I had to. Uh, cut out from the interview, for, sorry, from the, the slideshow and the speech because it was getting too long. But you, 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 abs you, are, you are absolutely right. Um, I think that initially uh, these guys sh choose this location because since the 70s, when Covent Garden was associated with the fruit and vegetable, mar covered fruit and vegetable market, and then it was turned into a shopping uh, and, uh, site and a touristic location. Uh, there, it, um, it was a place where artists could be perform and get money. Basking was al uh, allowed, right? So that's why, at the beginning, some crews, especially dancers, started to go there. But then, as the, uh, Greg Wilson said, bits by bits, <laughs> and because of word of mouth, from one or two crews, uh, the, the, the group started to uh, be bigger and bigger. On a Saturday or Sunday afternoon, there could be even 200 people uh, around there, uh, artists or wannabes or just people who want to be involved with the pop. So being such a touristic site, it was a problem with the for the police, right? And, and, and I think that this, though unconsciously at the beginning for these teen teenagers, this became a, a site of political struggle, political resistance, or cultural struggle, cultural resistance. And I think that the, 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 these teens were expressing 
resistant through art. And, 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 and I think that uh, hip hop became for, for them a tool to even to, to change what was uh, the um, uh, map of the city the, of, of London is in those days. It helped to change even in part um, uh, racial, rela racial relationship between those things. Then, on a more hip hop, uh, let's say, side, I think that um, Covent Garden being in the center, in the right in the center of the city, was a neutral space, right? Why? Because it was difficult from some, some crew in the, from North London going to South. I have vivid accounts of people telling me that they were staying in their neighborhood with their, with their crew. And so only when they started going, to, uh, to Covent Garden, they understood how hip hop was, was in the city and that there were many other crews, many other styles, which then started to be mixed. And that, that, those people coming from the different areas become like a super crew. And I have also vivid accounts of, 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 of the police getting there and trying to, to break those, those assemblies that for, for, with all uh, these people. Not only, I have also vivid accounts of Nazi attacks on this, on this youth. So you, you're totally right, you're totally right. I couldn't go so, uh, uh, so deep on, 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 Covent, on Covent Garden during the speech because I didn't have time, but I thank you for your question. And another thing I wanted to, to highlight is, and then Henry Chalfant, I, I saw some picture when, when some of the artists gave me their picture, I was seeing, I know this, this man, I know this man. And then I realized that was Henry Chalfant doing his pictures back then to the writers in London. But another interesting thing is that it's a little bit uh, goes against the, the fact that the police and the institution <coughs> tried to break these assemblies is the fact that the city government gave uh, the possibility, the chance to graffiti artists to paint on, on, uh, on, uh, on panels that were um, uh, all around the opera house that in those days was being uh, rebuilt. And so it's, it's, it's very strange. This uh, piece, this graffiti, remained for a long, long time. We're talking about months and then maybe other piece. So graffiti remained for years. Over there, so it's something that I want to go on understanding what happened, and that's that's why I love those years and and, and this uh, and this and this culture because it was so uh, creative and it brought so many uh, innovation even in the city, not just in the culture and in the style. So I don't know if I replied fully to your question, but thank you very much. Peace, G. Uh, thank you for this great presentation. Appreciate it. And you really are filling in uh, an important gap, I think, in, in the wider field of hip hop studies. So uh, thank, thank you. you. Um, a comment and then a, a question. Um, the first comment here, I, I like how you're framing the idea of uh, language and identity and, and creating and coming up with new language in particular. This is a pioneering of linguistics, if you think about the different ways people are pioneers. But I'm also thinking about, you know, just in the, the Caribbean connection, uh, I think it's Smiley culture uh, in reggae tradition doing Cockney translation. Absolutely, and yes. And then in Toronto, you get um, Cardinal Official doing Bacardi slang. And then a little bit different, you get Big L doing Ebonics, right? So this lang language and identity thing, I think, is a really important piece. So that, that's great. But my question is, um, you do a really nice job of you know, charting how hip hop comes to London and then takes hold, takes root, and, and, and evolves from there. And I'm thinking, as a Canadian and, um, you know, somebody who is, identifies or was, you know, positioned within the Commonwealth about how hip hop from London then goes back out into the world. And so when we talk about different kinds of, of di diaspora, Commonwealth becomes this sort of connective force in, in almost a diasporic sense, empire in a curious way, even though we, we push against it in a colonial context, um, that empire also has this global connective force. And so I'm wondering, is there anything in your research that might benefit from exploring how empire helps then put hip hop from London back out into the world so that people in the Commonwealth countries are connected in a, a slightly stronger way to this scene in England. 
Absolutely, yes. It's something that I have to go and, and, and study and check. And the example you were making about smiley culture and another innovation on another subculture, right? Reggae, reggae music. There was lovers rock and fast style chat where innovation brought in, uh, created in London and then transmitted back. And some of this song that, uh, some of the uh, song with this style uh, charted the, the uh, were uh, on the first places in the charts in Jamaica. Or hip hop, as you said, especially in, in the Anglophone countries, so in this sort of empire, started to really navigate uh, um, Def Jam, Def Jam sign um, uh, Derek B, one of the earliest uh, hip hop uh, uh, MC of the, that scene, and Ice T uh, sign uh, the other. Um, Star Wars is hijack the other group we, we, we saw in the documentary. So absolutely, you are right. I, I, I really need to get books or understand where I can get deeper on these aspects. Just two quick footnotes. One thing to remember about Covent Garden, Garden is that when I got there, and anybody British would know, traditionally, Covent Garden is also a synonym for the opera, the Royal Opera yes. House is there. So there were always street Acts. Or, the, these black groups weren't the first to be street performers at Covent Garden. It was already a site for street performers. Oh, yes, performers. yes. Sorry. Because there were always deconstruct. I mean, you didn't say it, but I didn't want anyone to think. There was always this tension between high culture and street culture in, 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 the, in the way the English marvelously do it. And it had gone on for a long time at, at, at Covent Garden. The other thing is that I um, went to the Far East with two other Harvard professors in um, early January 1993. Late, the, I think the last week of December, and no, the first three weeks of 1993, right before Bill Clinton, I came back the, the day Bill Clinton was being inaugurated as president. So at night when we went to um, um, Taiwan, Taipei, Hong Kong, Guangzhou, Beijing, Ulaanbaatar, the capital of Mongolia, and back to Beijing. So at night, we're watching on TV, Sky TV. And I almost fell out of bed one night when there was like some kind of Mongolian hip hop, or, you know, this is 1993. And people were doing hip hop dance and hip hop, and it was like, whoa! So the next day at the University of, the Mongolian State University, where it was minus 42 degrees Celsius. I'll never forget this. I thought here was cold. No, <laughs> <laughs> because I learned that Fahrenheit and Celsius meet either minus 40 or minus 42. You can, you can give me a fact check on that, but I was there. I asked this audience, how many people, now I was lecturing, the title of my lecture was The Social and Political Implications of the Election of William Jefferson Clinton and Albert Gore. I said, how many of you have really heard of Bill Clinton or Al Gore? Nobody, 400 people in this room. I said, how many people have heard of Two Live Crew? <laughs> Every fucking body. <laughs> no, and I was shocked because I, so all I'm saying is that the lines of descent of hip hop or its trans, transmission, it, it, it was like a universal phenomenon. I don't know how by 1993, there were these hip hop groups in Mongolia and in India, wherever the Sky TV network was, because it was a Far East pan Asian audience, oh. right? But they were featuring indigenous hip hop artists singing in uh, local languages. Rather, So I found that fascinating. So I don't know if you do a US to uh, Black Britain, Caribbean, there's also all kind of other stuff happening outside that next. Absolutely. It all starts with the United States, but how it got to Mongolia, God only knows. But, I got but it wasn't by Covent Garden, I can uh, tell you that. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I would like just to, to, to tell you that the, this project came about because in 2009 I was in London and I was uh, doing a beat maker competition. I was there because there was an American MC. So I traveled to London to interview this American MC. This American MC called Mikey D had won the new music seminary uh, for MCing in 1989. While he was telling me his story uh, about that performance, a few people, we were on the backstage, so a few people started sitting there and, and, and in a little while, they started interacting with me and with the interviewer, and it became and it became 
a, a, a conversation, a collective uh, dialogue. And these people, I later discovered, were uh, the ones who created the, the, the UK hip hop scene. And they were telling me how they were already in 1988 here in the UK. So what I, I'm saying is that I started this, 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 uh, this project because that day I had for the first time the, the tale of the MC who was on the stage and from the audience who was uh, uh, li looking that, 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 um, that performance. And for the first time I turned myself and instead of writing for my people about uh, US uh, hip hop and culture and black history, I started writing for the first time about another reality, the UK one. And I discovered then the, but absolutely, it's, it's something that I think that by the late 80s, there were virtually pop communities all around the world. And you're giving me a, a vivid testimony of uh, Eastern Asia, the uh, places where I didn't know, but I know a lot about Afri Africa and about Europe, because by the late 80s, I, w I, was, I was traveling al already around Europe and I was connecting with other uh, activists and with other hip hop lovers all around Europe. So I, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Giuseppe, uh, for this rich outline that you're providing here. And pardon me for being the fifth male voice. It's uh, very emblematic of hip hop huh? <laughs> uh, in this conversation so far. Okay, um, okay. But um, I'm, I'm wondering, so it sounds like you're situating this UK style, as you're defining here, uh, is coming out of uh, 1990, How's Life in London? Um, yes, from the, 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 the second part of the 80s, yeah. they started to define this new style. Right. Then, as I told you, Hijack has Britcore, which is another style, but I decided to focus on this per peculiar mix of rap and reggae. Okay, and so my sort of musicological tendencies, when you say style, I think of aesthetics and sound, right? Um, and I'm trying to figure out what or how you're defining the UK style in terms of aesthetics, um, particularly in this moment that you're discussing. And so if there's a way to, I know one thing that uh, you mentioned was shifting dialects. You mentioned the sound system culture, reggae. It's uh, sort of uh, mixing with hip hop. But how are you thinking through aesthetically and also sonically what the UK hip hop style was? And was it indeed unique? And if it was, what was unique about it? Well, I... I, I, I um what I think and what I try to express also through the video, the, 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 the extract of the documentary I screen, I, I think that uh, on, on, a, on a language level, what I said, uh, putting together uh, some system culture, hip hop and, and reggae was their way. And the way they did it was unique. Then we can say the same uh, from the music, okay, from the beat, creating the beats. This, 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 as, as I told you, when I was uh, asking them which were their first musical experiences, I had uh, replies that were involved with reggae music or other Caribbean rhythms, right? And even uh, talking about American, um, the American context, they didn't have the same reference. Just to make an example, in the 80s, most of the uh, pop producers uh, were sample, I mean, James Brown, his catalog was, was uh, taken, uh, it was an assault uh, of, on his catalog. These guys, even when they were referring to uh, soul, they, they had different uh, uh, references. And so I, I, this is what happened. They, they, as dancing was a, a really big part of it, they speed up the, the music and they tried to insert different kind of samples that were, if, you, if we have time and we listen to a few songs, you will see they, they sound totally different. So the mix of the language, the use of uh, the dialects, the patois, and, and, and the cockney, and this kind of music created that, that, that style. And if you want, or uh, instead, on a visual representation, even the way they looked, they dressed, was different different from, from the United States. I don't know if I'm, as I'm not a musicologist, I don't know if I'm re replying to the, fully to your question, but I, will, I would like to, maybe when we eat, I would like to go on understanding how I can reply in a better way uh, on my, on my, on my um, um, text, how I can insert this and, and, and explain it in a wider and better way. Marcy, what are we? 
Oh, okay. Uh, okay. I can, I can, but I can. Okay. So my question, okay, can I, I think you've begun sort of answering some of this, but part of it was like when, when um, you read from uh, what Dr. Morgan had talked about in terms of hip hop adopting each kind of style and taking it and, and incorporating whatever culture that it kind of lands, then it's kind of then lends itself to this idea of this creolization, you know, creolization when two languages meet, then the next generation then, you know, has then its own la Creole language, which has its own structures, et cetera. And so you're mentioning the cognate, you're mentioning the accents, and so does, I forgot the artist's name in the video, but I'm wondering semantically and sort of in terms of pragmatics, like do some of the language structures themselves change in the second generation? Um, and my other little tiny question, I'll just get in there, is about the recapitulation, like in, the United States, you know, well, the like lingua franca of, strangely enough, of hip hop is like the American idiom. So I wonder in Britain, and particularly in London, you know, does it do the same kind of thing historically, and this is related to creolization, of recapitulating through, like in America, slavery, construction, great migration to urbanization, does it do the same thing from imperialism, colonialism, D Duran talked about the sus laws and his. Um, yes. But so, so are there examples of that as well? I don't know if that's too much to answer. Right no, 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 no. I, I have to. As you said, I'm not a, I'm not an, uh, an anthropologist and I'm not a, uh, an expert in linguistic. But yes, I would say that the, it has changed and there are evidence of this uh, innovation in the language from those mid '80s. I can I can I can bring some some not now but because I don't have a, on me but I can show you different examples of what you were asking and in, instead uh, for the second part I think uh, as I just started uh, my 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 research I think that this is one of the issue I wanna I wanna uh, study and understand more and uh, again I'm 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 telling any everyone even later when we, when we are eating if there's any book. Uh, or people I should interview, and I thank you, uh, Dr. Gates, for the for the advices, and I would like to interview you as well. But we can talk. Okay, but I know that I can ask you many different questions relating to my to my research. Okay, okay. Yeah, I just wanted to um, um, actually make a comment. And hopefully, discussion can continue outside. And, and that is that, especially when it comes to language, what you're getting in hip hop is the ideology. And so, lot, you know, what happens within a particular place is complex based on everything that's happening in that environment. But the ideology of you represent, you know, you get in where you fit in. You 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 have to have some sense of the culture you're in and the change that you're representing keeps the move going in hip hop and people wonder why it's still here it's because it's about representation it's about resistance and that ideology in the language using expressions you know where does the word woke come from you know for example well it comes from you know when you're you're using verbs and you have an irregular verb that's not supposed to be used like a regular right. verb right and it's it's that kind of thing that makes everyone not only jerky, but they remember it, you know? And so all of that is happening, and it's part of that, like we're here. And um, I think that your talk today really has helped reinforce that notion that not only is hip hop here, it's, you know, worldwide domination, you know? <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>